We lift up everyone that's here in this sanctuary, everyone that's going to be listening to this. Father, every one of our church family that can't make it for whatever reason or another. Father, we just know everybody's fighting the battle. It's the same every week. We all have seasons and battles in our lives and struggles, and Father, we need you in there. We need you in our lives. And Father, as we come to you, music and message, let your words be heard. Let them go into our hearts and let's carry them out outside of these church walls into this dark world like a light and a lantern, Father, to shine the way for others. And Father, help us to be good business cards for you. Father, through our actions more than our words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That I swore I would never go back I was blind to the truth Didn't know what I had I was running I was searching But every place I turned for healing Left me more broken than the last Take me back To the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my bones Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church 
Trying to walk on my own but I'm wound up lost Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross It's not a trophy for the winners It's a shelter for the sinners And it's right where I belong Take me back to the place that feels like home To the people I can depend on To the faith that's in my walls Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I wanna go to church I wanna go to church It's in my bones Take me back To a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I wanna go to church can have a seat hear the sirens hope they're not coming to get us hope everybody's had a good week um y'all we got a bunch of pictures today for our uh for our announcements we were honored to be part of the uh welcome church closing service last sunday at 3 30 this was where the presbyterian folks officially closed the church building we like to think of it though that it's not closing it's just continuing in a different name that church was built back in the 50s, early 60s. That Holy Spirit's still there. And that's the most important thing. Church names change, but our mission never does or it never should. And on the left, that was uh, my left. This way, uh, Kevin Carty, he's the pastor of Ware Shoals uh, First Presbyterian. He presented us with a Bible that was there in the church and is there in the pulpit right now. And work day uh, for everyone that came out to work. Oh my gosh, it was wonderful. Uh, that's a couple before and afters. The church signed there, and then Will and Gordon came up with his pressure washer. Greg was there. Mac was there. Jimmy and Derek were there. Lisa and I were there. Uh, Von Dale was there. Everybody, it's okay. We got more. In the, we, we gonna have more work days. It's all good. And there's so many folks that, and there have been multiple work days there. And uh, that's some more action shots right there. And y'all, it's just taking shape. It is just beginning to take shape. And then working, oh goodness, I uh, hope I remember everybody. I was there, Jimmy, Derek, Jennifer, and then Vondell, Mac, uh, Mac's sister Colleen, Greg was there. And we also wanted to give some shout outs to uh, Joey Mitchell and r, r Tree Service, the huge pecan tree that was there beside the church. And it was beautiful, but it had already given the church a present. Huge limb had fell a couple of years ago, crashed through part of the roof, and we had to make a decision that it had, it had to go. And Joey came out in the middle of the rain that we were having that week on the 5th cut it down, and that tree was hanging over the sanctuary between two power lines. Not a bit of damage. Would recommend him for anybody that has any tree, uh, tree needs. And then also Michael Guest. Michael, some of y'all know him. He's just this amazing fella in Honey Pass, South Carolina. And Guest stump grinding. Thomas was able to 
the the stump that was left from the pecan tree and Thomas and Jimmy were able to and Jimmy and Derek were able to cut down some shrubs at the other end of the driveway because when you went to pull out you couldn't see what was coming either way and Michael ground all of those for us it, all of them it looks really good and we're just really thankful for them and then also there have been other days of cleaning uh, that's Jennifer and then Ryland came down and helped, uh, Darlene and Lisa was there, and then not pictured, Mac and then Sharon and uh, Suzanne were also down there as well, and Braden helped move stuff, and I think we got his picture here somewhere. Can't leave out Superstar. That was uh, Braden and then Mac and Darlene and Lisa involved with that, and so we're getting our stuff out of storage a little bit at a time. It's a, uh, you never, Mac and Thomas had this amazing ability to be able to pack all that stuff. You could not get one molecule in those three storage units, but they packed every bit of our stuff and it's all going to come in handy and just excited about it. And that's before and after. And it's kind of hard to tell, but that sidewalk was pressure washed. It was all trimmed up. That grass was cut away. Um, the bricks all been pressure washed. We've got estimates for a roof. We've got estimates for signs. We're getting on in the midst of getting all those. And that brings me to next Sunday, 11 o'clock. And that sound, that sounds good. Actually, I'm going to be cooking some up like that. And so what we're going to do is have a brief service at the new church. And that's at 1120 Turkey Creek Road. In where shoals. Eleven, we're gonna have a brief service and then we're gonna be eating. The church is gonna fry chicken and well, we're gonna get fried chicken and then um everybody just bring some. Whatever you got. It'll be more than you know, it'll always be enough. And what am I forgetting? Oh, board meeting after the service today. And let me see what else we got here. Prayer list. This is a good lead in for that. Want to lift up some of our own here. Uh, Greg Stanley, he is down with his back right now. We want to lift him up. Thomas Price, out with his back. Jennifer Vondale, y'all working these fellas to death. Um, Greg Wilson, Greg is dealing with a bad stomach virus. And those that know Greg, he is tough as nails. And Darlene had to go get him from work yesterday. And for Greg, that is, man, Greg's had broke ribs. He's been gored by a wild boar. I, you name it, it's happened to him. And for him to be down with the virus, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. We want to pray for these fellows to get feeling better here soon. And let's see now. Any updates? I mean, my is on the prayer list. Can we add anybody to the prayer list? Okie doke. Well, uh, I tell you. Okay, Delise Willis. Okay. And there we go. All right. Anybody else? Any other changes? Oh, and y'all with the dinner, if y'all know, this is a good time to invite somebody. So if y'all want to, Jimmy, would you make sure that Derek and Lisa know about it? And because they're more than welcome, I've invited a few folks that. Oh, yeah. That, sound, that sounds good, Kim. That's a good idea. And let's see now. Okay, I think that's it. Um, Mac, um, Mac, Robbie, I should know who you are. <laughs> Can I get y'all to come up and help with the offering? You have to forgive your old brother. He is. It's been one of those weeks. It's okay, Mac. We're not on the schedule. So it's all good. Yeah. Well, it's a good time to pray for those type of struggles. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. And Father, just thank you. Thank you for this church family. Father, through the sunshine, through the rain, thank you for all of them. And Father, thank you for all that you do for us. All of your blessings are shown in ways that many times we take for granted.
a roof over our heads, the ability to turn on the light when we flip the switch, food in our refrigerator. Father, there are people that struggle for those things, and you provide them. And Father, we lift up the blessing of this church building that you have provided us with, and your fingerprints are all over it. And Father, we just ask that we be a church family that is pleasing and does right in your eyes, Father, that we do more than talk about you one day a week. We go through life with each other every day of the week. And Father, we live our lives as business cards for you so that people can see through how we act what Jesus is all about. And Father, as we give you back just a portion of what you give to us, Father, just use it for, help us to use it for your purposes in ways that are pleasing right in your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. and I got to go to Greenwood Saturday. Uh, had to drop off some stuff to the new church and I got a haircut and then we had some lunch and I needed a haircut bad. I was looking like I thought people were going to start giving me quarters and dimes. I was look, about looking homeless. And the first time we'd had lunch together in a while. You know, it's funny you would think working from home most of the time that we would eat lunch more but we all, it's constantly we've got different stuff we're doing. And so, and also I'd been to Boston this weekend. We chose a place, one of Lisa's favorites, and we'd eaten there many times. And this time, though, things were off. Service was okay, but I saw the bottom of my tea glass several times. Uh, you know, it was okay, though. The vegetables, they forgot what a spice rack was. Have enough of that when I go up north. Uh, biscuits. They tasted different, almost like they were frozen. And overall, the portions were smaller, but the prices weren't. And now, I say this with a grain of salt. Food servers everywhere, God love you. Y'all put up with more than I could ever put up with in my entire, with, I, I would have already done dumped some on somebody's head. And we were really polite about it, and I, we tipped normally what we normally do, and it wasn't a disaster, but we started thinking about what's going on with one of our favorite lunch spaces, places. Were they having an off day? Not likely. That doesn't make for a good conspiracy theory or a good Sunday church message. So we're going to throw that one aside. I think that they were cutting every corner they could find to cut. And cutting corners is defined as to do something in the easiest, cheapest, or quickest way, often by ignoring rules or leaving something out at the expense of high standards. Sometimes you can get away with cutting corners. Sometimes it doesn't work real well, though. Today we're going to look at Scripture, and it deals with figuratively and literally cutting corners. And we're going to see what lessons there are for us to learn. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel 24 verses 1 through 7. That's 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 7. Now, verses 1 and 2, Saul 
was in the midst of, he had finished fighting the Philistines, and he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. Now, as a background, in the last chapter, God performed a miracle. He distracted Saul to attack the Philistines or fight the Philistines who were attacking Israel so that David could get away. Because Saul had him surrounded, this was going to be the end of it. But Saul was done with the Philistines now. He was back on his way to fight, uh, find David and kill him. King Saul hated David for many reasons. David was popular with the people. One of the things that started off when David, after David killed Goliath and he became an officer in Saul's army, there was a story, a, a song, where Saul killed the thousands and David killed the ten thousands, and Saul got jealous. David was skilled as a warrior, skilled as a speaker. He was a good-looking fellow, too. He had favor with God. Saul knew that God had chosen David over him to be king. This wasn't because of what David did as much as it was Saul starting this. Actions of King Saul his arrogance led to God choosing David as king. Many times in life, we wish that our victories would be permanent victories. We wish that the spiritual enemies that follow us like Saul pursuing David would just give up. and We wouldn't have to follow him anymore, wouldn't have to bother with him anymore. But does that, is that how it works? Those old familiar faces, those old familiar feelings pop back up. And many times are going to keep coming back and back until we go to glory with God. That's the only permanent victory we're going to find. Now, when in the verse it talks about the wilderness of Engedi, and I looked this up, this canyon runs towards the Dead Sea, and you can still go there today. This creek that's described there is still there. The caves that are described here right now are still there. I think that's just amazing. And it's kind of like a little oasis out in the middle of this desert. And with all these caves, I saw a picture of them. It makes a great place for somebody on the lamb to be hiding because David and his men were all hiding from Saul at this point. They would have been killed on sight because they offered water, wildlife, and a good defensive position. Now, in verse 3, at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself, but as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. That indicates that's a big old cave, big enough to shelter a flock of sheep. And David, biblical scholars have estimated somewhere around 600 men with him. And all of them, or most of them, could hide in this cave. And the Bible, I believe, is a real book dealing with real people living real lives. They're going to have some of the details because folks have to take care of their personal needs. But something as basic and common as this, what are the chances the king of Israel would have to take a pit stop in a section where there are hundreds of caves and the very cave where there's over 600 people waiting to kill him at? Just popping in. You cannot, that's not coincidental. I think the, the fact that Saul went in here also meant they went in there alone. Nobody wants their bodyguards going into the uh, laboratory with them, so they went in there by themselves, and his soldiers and bodyguards outside the cave waiting on him, and you've got 600 dudes sitting in here just, just been waiting to, to, to kill him. This was arranged by God, not so much for Saul, but I think to test David, to train him, learn him, and to display his godly heart. Now, his men in verse 4, this is it. Christmas coming early. Go ahead. God said he'd deliver him to you. Here he is. We do this, we hit some drive through on the way home, and we're done. And shout out to me and Braden. They probably asked, is there a Waffle House available at this time? So, and David, 
crept up. He crept up and he cut part of Saul's robe, a corner of it. Then his conscience got to bother him. And he went back and he told his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. And then David calmed his men down. Our first point from this scripture to avoid peer pressure. How many times have you had to explain something to your parents or your boss and it started with so-and-so did it? I think we can all answer at least once or twice or a bunch of times on that. In some ways, we still have this when we see people out in the world. They do it. Why can't we? They're okay with it. Why can't we? And David's men, in their credit, they were excited this opportunity and they believed it was a gift from God. They would have followed him to the death. Some of them did. They knew it was no coincidence that Saul came alone in that cave at that moment, and they thought that this was an opportunity from God to kill him. On a previous occasion, God did promise David, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hands so that you may do with him as it seems good to you. They believed that this was the fulfillment of that promise and that David needed to seize the opportunity by faith and by the sword. David, he went and he cut that corner off that road. Imagine he's listening to him. He's getting pumped up. He goes up there with his sword and creeping towards him, covered by the darkness of the cave. There's probably, Saul's probably got a little torch or something. It's just shadows on those walls, and he's creeping from shadow to shadow. His men are excited because their lives as fugitives are about to end. Many of them will be reunited with their friends and their, will be associates of this new king of Israel. But as David came close to Saul and put forth his sword, he didn't bring it crashing down on Saul's neck or thrust it into his back. He cut off a corner, a corner of his robe, and some scholars wonder why. Why did he do that? And how could he get away with it? I know how he got away with it. David had practiced from childhood. Many times we don't understand God's preparations for our lives, but it begins usually in our childhood. He was a shepherd. He killed a lion, a bear. He became a warrior. He was trained in this to be silent when needed to be. David extended the borders of Israel after he became king to an era that it was, it's never seen again. Saul may have laid his robe down in one part of the cave and attended to his needs and others, so David didn't have to get right up next to him to cut a corner off his robe. Or it may have been enough noise and commotion, you got 3,000 people outside, 3,000 soldiers, horses, camels, chariots. They're making a lot of racket. David decided to spare Saul because he knew that God's promise said, you will inherit the throne of Israel. God promised him that. He knew that Saul was in the way of that promise, our next point is to admit when you're wrong. How's he wrong? God said, I'm going to get rid of him. I'm going to put you on there, on that throne. David knew it was disobedient of him to kill Saul. And why? Law of the jungle, they're out to get you. You get them first. God put Saul in a position of authority, and it was God's job to take care of Saul, not David's. David wanted the promise to be fulfilled, but he refused to try and fulfill God's promise through his own disobedience. How many times have we tried, and I find myself being guilty of this sometimes, where you try and do stuff for God, but are you doing stuff for God, or are you want to do stuff for Mark? Are we trying to reach out to this person for God, or are we doing it because we want to be noticed? You got to be careful when you do that. Sometimes when we have a promise from God, we think that we're justified in sinning to pursue that promise. This is always wrong. God will not lead you in a direction to sin. That would be like God, and we've had it through dream and vision that we'd have a new building, but that would be like 
me taking the duffel bag into a bank and saying, hold them up and try to get the money for it. Try and do it for God, but is that the right way? Believe me, there were times, but that's another, that's another message. <laughs> and when we see God got us into our building. God will fulfill his promise, but he'll do it his way and do it righteously. I know this to be true. How many potential leads did we look for over the last several years to try and find a building? Dead end after dead end after dead end, and then when it was supposed to happen, nothing stopped it. Nothing could stop it. And same thing with a personal life. And it's hard to wait on God's time sometimes. And it's hard to be that faithful because, you know, one commentator writer on this wrote, we need to be like Abraham who obeyed God even when it seemed that his own family would be sacrificed. That's hard. That is so hard to wait on God's promise in those circumstances. And it sometimes goes against our grain that we want to move and we want to do. And it's one of the hardest things in the world to be still. Even more, we need to be like Jesus. In Luke 4, Satan offered him the world. Just worship. Or just do nothing. He could have gotten by with just doing nothing. That was a case where he decided I had to do what I knew was right. In all this, we see David knew not only how to wait on the Lord, but he knew well when to wait on the Lord. We wait on the Lord by prayer and supplication, looking for the indication of his will. We wait for the Lord by patience and submission, looking for the inner position of his hand. Fancy way at God's time, not our time. We pray to him for our wants, and then whenever he starts moving, Sometimes it happens quick. David was determined that when he got on the throne of Israel, it wouldn't be because he got Saul out of the way, but because God got Saul out of the way. There may be things that you're struggling with right now that we're wanting to try and fix. And in that, we're praying with one hand and we're grabbing a hold of it in another. Because we want to fix it. There's some situation in our lives that we can't fix. Try as we might, it might be a person, it might be a situation, it might be a person in a situation, and you want to fix them so bad. You just want to fix them. But we have to let them go. David wanted God's fingerprints on that work and not his own. He wanted the clean conscience that comes from knowing it was God's work. That's a, that's a heck of a man. Somebody had turned me into an outlaw. Somebody had ran me off from my family. I don't know if I saw him there at the prehistoric urinal and I had a big old piece of steel in my hands. Mm -mm -mm. That's why King David's written in here and Mark Vaughn's not. <laughs> we also see something else about David. His heart didn't store up bitterness and anger towards Saul. Saul made his life completely miserable. David kept taking it to God. And he received cleansing from the hurt and the bitterness and the anger that only God can give. How many of us are walking around with anger and bitterness? And I admit I got my share. I do. I have trouble putting it all down. David was able to put it down. If he kept that bitterness and anger towards Saul and kept trying to give it and hadn't tried to give it to God, he probably wouldn't have been able to resist the temptation to kill him 
I must, and what would have been rush free? Tapped by an animal, disappeared, fell into a, cl into a cliff in the cave, but his heart troubled him. Shows his conscience. Many would only be troubled that they didn't take the opportunity to kill us all. Whenever I first read this, I got to admit which side I was kind of pulling for. David only cut off the corner of Saul's robe, and even that troubled him. The robe was a symbol of Saul's royal authority. And David felt bad because Saul wasn't get, didn't take that authority on his own. He was given that authority by God. Saul was anointed. When you raise your hand against that person that God anoints, unless you have, unless God has instructed you to do that, two wrongs don't make a right. David expresses this when he says, The Lord forbid that I should do anything to my master, Saul, the Lord's anointed, seeing he is anointed to the Lord. And David knew better than anyone that Saul was troubled. He was corrupt. He would, had threw a spear at him. He tried to have him killed. He gave his daughter in marriage, and then he's out to get rid of him. It was in God's power to take him away. And David wouldn't do what only the Lord was supposed to do. David not only kept himself from taking vengeance on Saul, but he also restrained his warriors. Many of these men who become outcasts themselves because of Saul, because of his corruptness, his evil. They had seen their brothers killed by Saul's troops. There's no greater bond among soldiers and warriors than among each other. Many men in that same situation would have said, well, I won't kill Saul now, but if one of my servants do it, it's, I mean, what can I do? Kind of like when some food gets dropped on the floor in a household with three dogs. Not that we would know about this. Their attitude is, we don't know how it happened, but we need to make the best of a bad situation. Let's eat. Our golden doodle came through the house with a tube of chapstick the other day. This, uh, this principle, they really take this principle to heart. David wouldn't do that. He didn't want them to sin. If he couldn't remove Saul, he didn't want them to because they would have sinned. They would have killed God's anointed. That brings us to the third point in the scripture. David acknowledged God's leadership and goodness in his life through his actions. Many times we say God is Lord, God is king of all, but how do we really acknowledge him in our lives? Do we acknowledge him beyond these walls? Do we acknowledge him in our everyday lives? Do we acknowledge him in front of others? Do we acknowledge him in front of our bros? David acknowledged him in front of 600 of his followers, his soldiers. David made a godly decision based on what he knew was right in God's eyes that affected his personal life to the core. He could have cut that corner. He could have went back to Jerusalem. He could have been king. But he knew it wasn't his time. God hadn't appointed him there. David's words were the words of a humble, tender conscience before God. They are the words of a man who felt guilty at merely cutting off a corner of someone's robe. When anyone else would have killed him, what was the side effect of that? What happened from that? Did his men look at him with shame? Did they look at him as a coward? They were amazed. And their strong following to him got even stronger. They saw his godliness. Godliness, holiness, all it is is doing the right thing for the right reason. You don't do it when it's convenient. You don't do it when you're in front of somebody. 
You just do it because you know it's the right thing. When they saw how he wanted to please God and everything, they followed him. They could have overpowered him. They could have killed Saul. But they followed him. Many times we think that we don't make a, that a Christian cannot make a difference in this world. That we can't make a difference in our work. We can't make a difference in our family. Just be that person. Don't cut the corners. You acknowledge, you avoid doing the right thing, the peer pressure, you avoid doing that. Admit when you're wrong. That's a hard thing to do. It's hard to admit when you're wrong. It's hard not to follow the crowd, especially, you know, with younger folks. Peer pressure is extremely strong, but it doesn't go away when you grow up. It's still there. And then finally, acknowledge God. Because when we cut in corners, what kind of product are we coming out with? Are we coming out with homemade biscuits, hot butter, and somebody that's giving you five stars? Are we coming out with frozen biscuits, broccoli, ain't got no seasoning on it, empty tea glasses, and I'm not going to give the name of the restaurant? You know who you are. And we don't want to be like that in life. Because just like the reputation of that place, and I wasn't the only person, the manager came out three times, three different tables. Do you want to be that kind of restaurant, or do you want to do the right thing? Where you have people around you that when you do something that is the right thing in God's eyes, it just amazes them. And they don't pull from you but they want to learn more. All right, going to get everybody to stand with me. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then the song's going to be playing. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, Father. This world is a world of cutting corners. This world is a world of what can we get by with. We see it in our work. We see it in our schools. We see it in our homes. Father, let's take the extra steps. Lead us and guide us in all our words, actions, decisions, Father with each other. Help us, Father, to be examples, to be those people that you want us to be. And, Father, not to brag or not to show off to people, but just help us to be the people that you want us to be, making decisions based on how you want us to make them. Help us to find and seek your face, Father, find your will for our lives. Help us to do that will. And in that way, Help us to be obedient. In that way, we're, gonna, we're going to help people find out about Jesus just in the way we live our lives. Father, don't let us be undercover Christians, cutting corners six days a week, but coming in here one day a week and trying to do the right thing. Father, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. We're going to make decisions based on our own selfish needs. Help us do better. All these things, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Standing in your ruins feels a lot like the end So used to losing, you're afraid to try again Right now all you see are ashes where there was a flame Truth is that you're not forgotten, cause grace knows your name God's not done with your broken heart and your wounds and your scars God's not done with you Even when you're lost and it's hard and you're falling apart God's not done with you It's not over, it's only begun So don't hide, don't run Cause God's not done There's a light you don't notice until you're standing in the dark And there's a strength that's growing inside your shattered heart Whoa. God's not done with you, even with your 
broken heart and your wounds and your scars So don't hide, don't run Cause God's not done with you You He's got a plan, this is part of it He's gonna finish when he started He's got a plan, this is part of it He's gonna finish when he started He's not done God's not done writing your story No, He's not done God's not done Our benediction this week comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 7. But as for you, be strong and courageous, for your work will be rewarded. Amen. Love y'all. Have a great week. And hopefully we'll see everybody Sunday and we'll a little message and then we're going to be eating.